good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, on behalf of Wilma Hale and Walter Gluvers, um, a very warm welcome, and warm it is indeed, uh, to our offices here uh, in Park Lane, as well as online. We have quite a few attendees also online due to the tube strike and otherwise from around the world. Um, my name is Maxi Scher. I'm a special counsel here at Wilmer and a professor at Queen Mary University of London. And maybe more importantly for today's purposes, the general editor of the Kluver, uh, Walters Kluver Journal of International Arbitration. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this launch of our latest special issue. And uh, I take it you've all been given a hard copy um, as you came in, if that's not the case. I'm sure we can give you uh, a one um, for, uh, from the spare ones we still have. The Journal of International Arbitration, of course, is one of the flagship uh, publications of Walter Kluver. And I welcome here uh, Cameron from Walter Kluver. So any questions about uh, you know, Kluver Journal, Kluver Arbitration, et cetera, you can direct to him. Um, and we do publish regularly uh, special issues on particular and topical uh, subject matters. And uh, in the past, just to give you a little bit of a flavor, we have published in 2016, only a month after the referendum in this country um, on Brexit, uh, a special issue on Brexit and the effects on international dispute resolution. There's a recording as well in case you want to watch this and go through the pains of this uh, uh, aftermath of Brexit referendum again. In 2017, we published a special issue on arbitration in Asia with a particular focus on, on this region. And in 2019, we had the pleasure of uh, publishing in a special issue the winning papers of the SEC Stockholm Treaty Lab uh, competition. Um, but today we're here to celebrate the launch of yet another uh, special issue and a, a, a one that has a very interesting topic, I think, um, on empirical analysis in international commercial arbitration and more specifically on the court judgments, national court judgments that are available on the Kluver database on uh, enforcement and set aside proceedings. Um, Empirical research, you will know, is becoming more and more important in law as a whole. And it is also true that there is a growing body of scholarship in international investment arbitration. However, so far, empirical research in the area of commercial arbitration has been rather scarce. And obviously, um, this is so because the access to data is rather complicated because of the confidential nature of arbitration, what is typically confidential nature of arbitration. So when uh, Roger and Monique and Krina came to me with this idea to uh, look at data in international commercial arbitration and do empirical research, um, I was, of course, very interested from the start in their project. And I'm not going to say anything more about this project, but actually hand over uh, to uh, the three of them who are the special issue editors. Um, and neither of them needs any introduction, so I'm going to keep these preliminaries short. Uh, Roger here on my right, Roger Alford, is a professor from Notre Dame in the US, uh, where he teaches and writes on a actually quite a wide variety of subject matters, uh, including international trade, international arbitration, um, antitrust, and competition law. And he will be familiar to many of you because he's the general editor of the Kluver Arbitration blog. Uh, Professor Krina Baltag here on the very far left is a colleague from the Stockholm of University, University of Stockholm, um, but she's also a colleague because she has done her PhD um, at Queen Mary University of London on the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, she holds many editorial and board positions, um, including on the Journal of International Arbitration and the Kluver Arbitration blog, so she's particularly well placed. Um, to be here tonight. And last but certainly not least, here uh, on my left, uh, Dr. Monique Sasson, who is an independent arbitrator um, and has experience in international dispute resolution 
uh, for over 30 years. She's now um, uh, with Arbitra here in London. Um, but before becoming independent, she has also worked in various law firms in London, Rome, and New York. So uh, with that, uh, over to the three of them. And after that, we will have some more contributors online. Um, we will have, at the end, time for Q&A. So keep your questions and comments. Uh, we will certainly have time uh, to address them before going outside the terrace for drinks, which I'm also looking forward to. <laughs> Thank you very much, much, Maxi. Th and thank you for the chance to be here. And I appreciate your, all of you making the special effort to come biking, walking, taxiing, you know, at exorbitant uh, surge rates on Uber. And I appreciate you coming to, to this event uh, to, to celebrate this, this new development. We're extremely excited about this special issue. And the hope is that in empirical research and empirical analysis of international commercial arbitration will become a new cottage industry for academics, just like it has with investment arbitration. The genesis of the project basically started three years ago. Um, Matthew Hall is a colleague of mine at Notre Dame, uh, who's uh, an empirical scholar. And he emailed everyone in the law school and said, I'm looking for new databases to mine. And I would love to talk with any of you that want to talk about um, an empirical analysis of, of work that you have. And immediately it piqued my interest, because I have been working uh, with Kluwer, Walters Kluwer for literally over 25 years on the database. I've been with Arbit KluwerArbitration.com since um, it launched in early 2001. Um, I originally started a website called InternationalADR.com and then Kluwer partnered with me to make it KluwerArbitration.com and so I've been with KluwerArbitration.com from the very, very beginning. And then Krina and Monique have been with uh, the blog and, and the database for over 10 years as well. So Matthew said, you tell me what questions to ask and I can run the numbers. Like just, you know, I, tell me what to ask and I can run the numbers. So we have a, Matthew Hall is a, a truly very, very high quality empiricist. And so I, I immediately reached out to Karina and Monique and said, let's do a database analysis of, you know, of all of the national court decisions that are in the database. They've been there for 20 years and no one's ever touched them. No one's ever looked at them. And so we did that. Uh, COVID uh, uh, hit in March of 2000, which meant I had way more students wanting to do work for me than I normally would have because all of the law firms said, oh, we don't actually need you this summer. We're so sorry. So, um, so I actually had a large number of students working with me, coding every single decision. And ultimately, we coded 553 court decisions on the enforcement side and 504 court decisions on the vacature set aside. And so that's the data set, just over a thousand cases from around the world in the Kluwer arbitration data set. Um, and then we basically ask several questions. We ask horizontal questions and vertical questions, I guess you could say, which is how are issues being addressed across countries around the world? And then how are specific enforcement claims or vacature arguments, how are those being addressed? How often are they raised? And how often are they successful? Is essentially what we were doing. So we were looking like, Everyone says England is very arbitration friendly. France is very arbitration friendly. Is that really true? Is it just anecdotal or is it actually true? Um, and then everyone says things like public policy never wins. You know, you can raise it, but you'll never succeed, right? Or if you do succeed, it's rare. Well, we can actually know the answer to that question now. We actually know if public policy is, is the kind of thing that succeeds or not, right, in this data set. And so um, I encourage you to uh, read the article and look at it in great detail. Um, I think a lot of the things that we thought were true continue to be true. Our England is, in fact, arbitration friendly. Um, it's a very positive place for the enforcement. But there are things that are surprising. Um, uh, for example, one would expect that the ability to enforce a decision would be easier um, than, and, and the percentages would be different than, say, what would happen in defending against the set aside. Right. Whereas the data reveals, as we say in the, in the article, 73% of cases in the data said uh, enforcement is successful. So 27% of the time, uh, an attempt to challenge an enforcement of an award is successful. And in 73% of the time, it is not successful. The vast majority of time, an arbitration award is going to be enforced even when it's challenged, 73% of the time. One might expect a set-aside would be, and, and Karina will talk about this in, in, in greater detail, that a set-aside case might have greater success, but in fact, only 23% of the time is a set-aside case actually successful. 
So the vast majority of time, it's not successful. Um, other things in the database that are a little bit contrary to the evidence, one would expect that there's a home court advantage, right? That if you're a party to a case, either as a defendant or a plaintiff, that you would have a likelihood, greater likelihood of success, especially if it's a government involved on the plaintiff side or on the defense side. The natural sort of anecdotal wisdom in the international arbitration community is that there's such a thing as home court advantage, at least in some jurisdictions, right? What we found in the data set is there's not a home court advantage on the plaintiff side or on the defense side, with governments or without governments. Um, that generally speaking, uh, the data indicates that the likelihood of succeeding or not succeeding in international arbitration does not depend on the nationality of the parties. That's not necessarily consistent with the prevailing wisdom. So those are the kinds of things that we looked at. Uh, we also looked at every single grounds for challenge, all 19, all of them in Article 5 of the New York Convention, as well as the ones that are not expressly in the New York Convention, but are routinely argued, like statute of limitations or form not convenience. Um, and we coded them and how often they're successful. Um, and the ones that you would expect would be successful often are, like set aside is often successful, but the ones that you might not expect would be successful or also successful. So those are the kinds of research that we want. My big takeaway, the big, big takeaway from the project is we want the arbitration community to embrace empirical evidence and look at it not just from anecdotes but actual, actual data. And so the hope is um, that other empiricists will take on the project and look at the, these questions in greater detail. The data set is not yet on the open science framework, but it will be on the open science framework. So any empiricist that wants to look at our data set will be able to do so. And then look at uh, other questions that we didn't necessarily consider. So we're very excited about it and, and we encourage your feedback and, and, and thoughts regarding the project. So Karina and Monique. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Maxi, for the generosity and everybody in the room and online. Um, it is wonderful to work on a project with dear friends. Um, this, is a, this was a pleasant exercise. And as uh, Roger was saying, we're, we're just probably continuing some of our previous research as well. Um, we were challenged to look at the numbers a bit in, um, I would say, in, in a holistic manner and understand where these numbers would sit by looking at arbitration and if arbitration continues to be a feasible dispute resolution mechanism. And, and, uh, and, and Monique will add to this. Um, in 2007, I was involved in uh, Queen Mary uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers research on uh, settlement and recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. And this surveys of, of Queen Mary, of course, they, 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 go, they, they look at the corporate council in particular and their experiences with international arbitration. So it's, it's different than what we uh, um, did in this uh, empirical research, obviously. But at that time in 2008, the data was very interesting, revealing that uh, a, a surprising number of over 75% of the arbitrations would be complied with, uh, the awards complied with voluntarily. So if we take this number and say, well, 25% would likely go to court in a set aside or recognition and enforcement uh, procedure, uh, then the numbers that we have, and, and, and again, Monique will put this in, in, in a bit more perspective, um, we still conclude that arbitration is indeed um, um, a, a very used and useful dispute resolution mechanism. Um, and I think the role of the empirical research ultimately is to tell us or to, to let us know and understand how law works in practice. And the exercise has a finality that means where can we uh, implement reforms? Where can we uh, address certain concerns perhaps jurisdiction by jurisdiction, arbitration institution by arbitra arbitration institution, how the law, uh, laws are framed, and so on. Um, with respect to set aside, I think the numbers are very interesting if you look in the, in the survey, and not necessarily um, the grounds that I raised in the, in the set aside proceedings will be successfully uh, retained by the courts. One, 
I would say, pertinent example is uh, the ground, uh, the inability to present the case, um, raised in 35% of the cases. But when it comes to how successful that is uh, before the courts, that is only 11%. Um, you're also going to see, um, and I think this was a very interesting exercise for us, that certain arguments are paired together, certain grounds are raised together in the proceedings. For example, no notice of arbitrator appointment will likely go with no notice of arbitration proceedings. Um, no valid under law would go with subject matter not capable of settlement. So, so this is also interesting in how often the parties would raise um, different grounds and how successful they are individually or together. Um, I also looked at specifically um, recognition and enforcement uh, Article 5.1e under the New York Convention, how often set aside awards are actually recognized and enforced by national courts. And actually, this, was, this is a ground raised in 10% of the cases of, uh, of uh, recognition and enforcement. Um, and it's actually the most successfully successful one in practice. In 34% of these cases, the courts upheld the defendant's argument. That is, if the award is set aside at the place of arbitration or under the law, then it should not be recognized and enforced uh, before other national courts. Uh, but of course, the numbers will tell us something. Um, and, and it was very interesting for those familiar with the more recent Maximov case, which went uh, to the Dutch, French, and English courts, the attitude of the courts was quite different. Um, and we did have numbers, and of course, France is a, is a, is a different uh, discussion altogether, but we had the numbers on the Dutch and English, uh, uh, English courts. Uh, before the Dutch courts, in 35% of the cases, this ground is actually upheld by the court. So you cannot go and enforce a set aside award before the Dutch courts. For the English courts, actually the percentage is higher, 75%. So it's likely that you'll, not be, you'll be successful in relying on Article 5.1e of the New York Convention. But I will, I will leave the floor to Monique to, to put you a bit more perspective to my initial comment and discuss uh, a bit the public policy issue. Thank you very much, Karina, and again, thank you, Maxi, for this wonderful opportunity uh, that you gave us in uh, addressing um, the data issue. So I just would like to make a couple of general points uh, which I thought were relevant. The first one is diversity in terms of geographical diversity. The countries, all the judgments were coming from 74 countries, which is extraordinary, thinking that we're only speaking about France, England, the States, Switzerland. So for the first time, I think, we looked at the jurisdiction across the board. So then I think I want to go back a little bit on the point that Roger made about anecdotal evidence. I, as a practitioner, thought that, for example, the percentage of uh, arbitration ad hoc was much higher. Instead, we looked at uh, all the court judgment and uh, we distinguished whether they were institutional or ad hoc, and we looked at, uh, we realized that the ad hoc arbitration um, proceedings that then went, were enforced were only 7%. And I have to say that this is definitely contrary to anecdotal evidence where I feel like it's almost half-half or definitely 30% of my practice has been thus far in ad hoc arbitrations. Then, which means that either they don't get enforced or they are, um, they are just complied with automatically. Then the other point I wanted to make is again about diversity in terms of institutions. The award came from proceeding administered by 110 institutions. And this is, again, quite extraordinary. So 20% of uh, the court judgment were related to uh, awards coming from ICC proceedings. But as far as the rest is concerned, we have 20% what wasn't clear, but we had many other um, uh, institutions. So again, in terms of uh, diversity, we feel that we gave voice to um, arbitration award enforced in, juris in different jurisdiction and um, coming from uh, various institutions. Final point on uh, nationality, claimants' nationality. We have, so the majority of claimants and respondents were from the US, of course, but it, that is only an 8% uh, out of all. So it's true that the, the biggest chunk of uh, 
uh, recognition enforcement setting aside cases ca came from claimants and respondents coming from the, the usual suspects, so the nine of Germany, Switzerland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, um, in England, the US of course, but then um, there are other countries recognized. So um, having said just this uh, couple of points, actually the last one is about set aside and um, recognition and enforcement whereby the percentages are similar. So despite everybody saying that we need a general international convention like the New York Convention for setting aside, the data tells us that even if set aside, of course, apart from the UNCTAD countries, but there are, there are a few there, uh, all the others have different type of legislation, but somehow the results do not differ. So arbitration awards are enforced and are not set aside in the same percentage or more like broadly same percentages. I looked at uh, uh, public policy, which is uh, uh, the uh, objection that was raised uh, more often in all these court proceedings. So it was raised in 44% of enforcement proceedings and 38% in setting aside. So enforcement proceeding, we all know the uh, rule of the New York Convention, Article 52B, um, but uh, in uh, set aside is of course very, so we, we generally define public policy because it's always mentioned. It's something that has been raised uh, in almost universally, so you know 44%, so nearly not half of the cases, but almost there. But it was uh, um, upheld in 20%, so one in five. So numerically, if you think about overall, is one in eight. Uh, which of course means that uh, it's uh, an objection that you raise almost all the time that is not very successful, but uh, numerically it's there and people have to be uh, aware. Uh, we, so I looked at all these cases, so there were m approximately 70 cases. I just um, saw what, uh, where, they, where they were, of course, uh, with the public policy exception was uh, um, upheld and they were uh, mentioning several issues. So for example, there were several on national sovereignty, couple on par condition creditorium and the fact that there were uh, bankruptcy proceedings and there was a possible uh, breach of uh, uh, par condition creditorium. There were of course fraud and corruptions and with fraud and corruption we had the differences between France and uh, uh, in England and uh, you know to the extent to what to what extent court should give, uh, um, should look at the determination and take into account the determination done by tribunal. So if the tri arbitral tribunal has run through them, uh, what is the consequence? And of course, uh, with fraud and corruption is where you have mainly uh, this issue raised and it's quite uh, important because we have on that two school of thoughts. We have the maximalist uh, school of thoughts and we have the minimalist school of thoughts. So with one school of thoughts, the idea is that uh, a court should really be there to look at what has happened and revisit the entire issue because fraud and corruption are main things and we don't want courts upholding judgment with arbitration award which, with, um, which might be uh, tainted by corruption. Instead, with a minimalist approach, we have a different uh, um, idea behind there saying that basically you should not use public policy to have a de novo review. So once all this argument has been run before uh, arbitral tribunal, that's it. So the court would just look for something that uh, might be really uh, major uh, in order to uh, allow the uh, revision. Uh, of course, one of uh, the, the issue of definition of public policy is uh, varied. So Every court says that is uh, a, a violation of the most basic principles. Of course, we all know that uh, authors and court and authors are an arbitrator are saying that public policy is the mo is an autonomous definition, is an international definition. I would say that courts are generally quite evasive on that. They say this is the most basic principle, and sometimes they get it right. Sometimes uh, I felt that in the decision they were probably trying to really. Uh, get a de novo review of uh, uh, the arbitral um, award. They, with public policy, we have really to, the courts are trying to seek a balance between the autonomy for arbitration on one hand and the state uh, right to preserve its legal system. 
I thought that also on uh, uh, looking at the cases, this has been really confirmed by the majority of the cases, so only narrow, in a narrow percentage uh, of the cases, the uh, court really went uh, trying to say, for example, that the applicable law had not been um, applied correctly and this was a breach of public policy. So apart from this uh, decision, which were really at the outskirts, I think generally speaking, it is an interpretation, it is a, a catch-all provision that somehow has been used to avoid a de novo, um, de novo review. But of course, uh, is uh, uh, always can be used for um, issues that uh, might, might not and should not be there. So, for example, Mexican court decided that statute of limitation was of public policy in nature. So, of course, this is what we should try to avoid in the sense that the international, the autonomous uh, uh, definition of public policy should really not allow this. Um, and looking again at the anecdotal evidence, and this is my last remark, uh, I was convinced, for example, that in uh, China there would be several issues with public policy as to how the awards were enforced. And instead, they are out of 37 cases. We are talking only about recognition and enforcement. Only three were set aside for, uh, for sorry, not recognized and enforced for public policy. And instead, um, in China, the majority of the award not uh, recognized and enforced were concerning issue of due process. So the fact that uh, the request for arbitration in that case was not uh, uh, served properly on uh, the defendant. And I have to say that, for example, for me, I didn't appreciate that that would be such a uh, recurrent issue in uh, that jurisdiction. So this is an example where something like that has to be looked at by practitioners thinking that uh, if you have a case, you have to pay particular attention on how service or process is done and how courts, um, in case, of course, the assets are there, are looking at this issue. And uh, uh, this is the relevance of running empirical searches where really they should give guidance to practitioners in order to understand also how to plead their cases. Maxi, may I leave the word to you? <laughs> thank you, thank you to all three of you for giving us an overview over the project, the methodology, your main findings. It's, it's been really uh, very insightful, um, uh, even on such a short time. Um, what we're gonna do now is actually zoom into some of the more specific topics, because as you will see from the uh, last page of of the, the special issue, there have actually been quite a few contributors uh, uh, to this special issue and, and uh, we've been very lucky. Um, I've been actually very lucky to be uh, counted amongst them. I was uh, uh, kindly invited by the uh, uh, special issue editors to uh, write a piece on um, the validity of the arbitration agreement. So I'm going to just say a few words on, on what we have done here and this is an article that I uh, co-wrote with my colleague, Dr. Ole Jensen. So we took a subset of the data set that actually dealt only with specific arguments regarding the validity or invalidity of the arbitration agreement under Article 5.1a of the New York Convention or equivalent provisions. These were 171 decisions altogether. And then this data set we subdivided into different arguments that the parties raised regarding the validity or invalidity of the arbitration agreement, such as, for instance, the arbitration agreement never came into existence, or it was terminated, or it never be it was invalid because of form requirements, or because it violated uh, mandatory laws of public policy, what I will refer to as substantive invalidity. And then we looked at Two things, what were the grounds most frequently invoked by parties trying to challenge the validity of the arbitration agreement and which were the most successful? And this led to a couple of surprises. The first surprise was about the most frequently invoked grounds. It is often said that the formal validity of an arbitration agreement is one of the most frequently invoked grounds under the New York Convention. Well, that is not confirmed by the data set we have. It was actually only raised in 9.3% of the cases, which is a, a fairly low um, percentage. The most invoked ground, however, and this may be to my surprise, was that of substantive invalidity, i.e. that the arbitration agreement violated mandatory law public policy. 
And the second surprise is related to the success rate of those grounds that were invoked by the parties. The two most successful grounds, and maybe this is not surprising, were that the arbitration did not exist or was inexplicable, and that one of the parties did not raise, sorry, did not sign the arbitration agreement. These were successful in 36.5 and 42% of the cases, um, respectively. So of the cases where those grounds were raised, quite a high number were successful. Many others were not as successful. And for instance, substantive invalidity was one of the not so successful grounds, which was only successful in about 20% of the cases. So while it was the most invoked ground, it was certainly one of the least successful. Um, so there is a mismatch, and that's the takeaway. There's a certain mismatch between how often parties invoke a certain ground and how successful um, it is. The second part of our paper, and I'm only going to briefly mention this because I want to turn to our online uh, speakers, uh, concerned the law governing the arbitration agreement. You will be aware that there's a lot of case law uh, and a lot of scholarship on the question of the law governing the arbitration agreement. I'm only going to mention here in this country the latest Supreme Court decisions in Enka versus Chubb and Kababji versus Cat Food. Um, but there is very little, if any, empirical uh, analysis on what is actually done around the world. So what we looked at is whether courts actually engage in any meaningful conflicts of law analysis at all, um, what are the conflicts of law rules they apply, and then, this is maybe the $30 billion question, um, is there any prevalence between the lex contractus, the law governing the contract where the arbitration agreement is found, or the law of the seat. But I'm not going to give you the answer. You can read the paper or you can ask me a question at the end in the Q&A. Because as I said, I want to now turn it to our online speakers who have been patiently waiting behind us. And we're going to start with Dr. Cecilia Carrara. Um, Cecilia is a partner at the law firm Legans in Rome. Uh, she was an ICC court member until recently. Um, and she holds other uh, positions of trust, the IBA, the DIS, the German Arbitration Institution. And in her contribution, um, Cecilia is going to tell us now, uh, she looked at the difficult question of conflicts of interest. So, Cecilia, over to you. Well, <laughs> thank you, Maxi, uh, and thank you to the issuers for having invited me to participate. I feel very, very lucky and indeed... Uh, I had the opportunity to look at uh, a variety of cases related to conflicts. And as we heard before, uh, the cases that are included in the database do not refer to challenges themselves because we are speaking of cases decided by the national courts. So it's both categories of vacatur actions and actions brought on the basis of conflicts of interest. Um, on the basis of the New York Convention, so uh, resisting recognition and enforcement. So here, the kind of analysis and conclusions that can be drawn are having regard at the intrinsic data, which is available on the database, and also comparing the results that the data suggests with the otherwise public data which may be collected from arbitral institutions on the number of challenges. Because I find a very interesting question is, how do conflicts of interest and arguments related to challenges play out in terms of number of applications and success rate in the first phase during arbitral proceedings and at the stage of challenges, and then subsequently either in vacatur actions in front of the courts or resisting recognition and enforcement. So this would be a comparison with extrinsic data from the database, from surveys and publications made available by arbitral institutions. And of course, there is always the test that Monique was referring to, which is the anecdotal evidence. And um, 
starting from the conclusion here, I think that uh, the numbers in terms of success rates of actions based on conflicts of interest, both at the stage of the challenges and then in front of the court, seem to be roughly aligned. And uh, I will now go into the details, but I wanted to anticipate the conclusion because another thought similar to one that has already been expressed by Monique is whether as a policy matter, it would make any sense to apply more stringent standards during the phase of challenges uh, when evaluating conflicts and disclosures as opposed to actions that are brought after the award is rendered, maybe in order to favor and promote the stability of the awards. It would seem that the similar tests are applied, or at least that from in terms of numbers, uh, the success rates are roughly comparable. So if we look at the categories of arguments, that may be derived from the two sets of uh, cases dealing with conflicts of interest in the database, these categories refer to uh, the um, uh, composition of the arbitral tribunal in accordance with the agreement uh, of the parties and composition of the arbitral, uh, of the arbitral tribunal in, not in accordance with the law of the country of the seat. Now, in analyzing the data, the assumption that I have made is that the majority of cases falling under these two categories actually refer to conflicts. So this is an assumption which uh, uh, I, I could not test. There might be other cases, of course, falling in, the, in these categories that refer, for instance, to special requirements that the arbitrators need to have. And, and do not process when appointed. So this is just a caveat that I would like to flag out. And according to the data, arguments related to the composition of the arbitral authority have been raised in vacatur actions in 6% to 15% of the cases. So it's, it's quite a, a significant number if, if we think of it uh, in terms of uh, how often this may be a recurring factor. And the percentage of vacatur actions successfully argued, in turn, on the basis of uh, the ground that the composition of the arbitral authority was not in line with the agreement of the parties, was 15%. So 15% out of the cases brought on, on this ground were successful, while the argument that the composition of the arbitral tribunal was not in accordance with the law of the seat, but been slightly more successful, so 20% of the cases. One may infer that this is due to the fact that national laws may have some specificities and that therefore uh, the, the national courts may be also stricter when evaluating the parameters based on their own legal systems. In terms of number of cases, out of a total of 404 vacatur cases uh, in, in the database, in 80 cases, these arguments have been made, and in 15 cases, they have been upheld. So uh, this is really a, a minor percentage of success in the end, but many cases in which the arguments were raised. Similarly, in enforcement actions. Here, in terms of absolute numbers, out of a total of 489 enforcement actions, in 61 cases, the arguments based on conflicts have been made, and only in 14 cases, they have been upheld. So I, I do think that uh, the, these numbers are very significant for practitioners and also for the parties when the parties ask, you know, whether they, they, it's worth to uh, raise a vacatur action or resist enforcement on the basis of conflicts. And I think it should 
uh, uh, raise the question as to whether parties and arbitrators based on these numbers uh, should be encouraged to rather make a challenge early or disclose elements of doubt more early rather than later, because uh, undoubtedly these arguments are used in very many cases after the award is rendered and in front of national courts. So I think uh, the, the, my personal takeaway uh, was that even for arbitrators, it is unpleasant to know that uh, if they do not disclose or if uh, there is an appearance of bias or for whatever strategic reasons, they may be exposed until the very end uh, to the risk of undergoing, not themselves personally, but of vacatur actions or enforcement, uh, um, actions to resist enforcement based on conflicts. And uh, out of the numbers, it doesn't seem that the success rate is so much higher in challenges as opposed to actions in front of the national courts. So I think this is an indication that uh, for some, it is seen as a second bite of an apple. And there might be very many parties that wait to raise arguments on conflicts, even if maybe they could have done so sooner. So th these are my takeaways, and I I go I, I leave uh, again the the word to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Cecilia. And uh, uh, we have two more snapshots, so to speak. And I do hope the sound is going to be a little bit better. Um, two more snapshots, which are actually regional snapshots, um, both looking at particular regions or countries. Uh, one, uh, uh, Latin America as a whole, which is a rather large region, um, and France. We've already talked a bit of France um, uh, early on, so we have uh, these uh, particular regions and countries that we're going to look at. Let's start uh, with Latin America, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Elina Meyers-Minskaya, who is a partner at Wageman and is um, based in Santiago de Chile, where she um, uh, advises clients in construction, infrastructure, mining, and energy projects. And she, as I said, looked at, in particular, uh, data uh, regarding uh, Latin America. Elina, handing over to you. Thank you very much, Maxi. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful I, I was invited to participate in this special issue. My article is called Latin America Isn't Going South, a Qualitative Sampling Analysis. Perhaps I should rename it to Tout va très bien, Madame la Marquise, as an old French song says. Please let me know what you think after I end my presentation. I used a sample of recent judicial decisions from Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Chile, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Peru. These countries were selected due to their distinct geographical location, North, Central, and South America, the similar size of their markets, and the different approach to the regulation of arbitration, that is, dualistic versus monistic. The decisions in the sample dealt with the setting aside of arbitral awards or the enforcement. Almost all of the decisions in the sample show ordinary courts' deference towards arbitration. As long as the courts operate within the framework established by the Unicentral Model Law or the New York Convention, Arbitral awards enjoy a high level of protection against unjustified attacks. Basically, all cases of the sample ended with the confirmation of the underlying award. However, there is also a trend that is common to at least five out of seven jurisdictions in the sample. That is, constitutional actions for protection of fundamental rights tutela or amparo in Spanish, are used repeatedly to attack the awards or rather the judicial decisions that confirm the awards. 
These constitutional actions, actions have been mainly unsuccessful and have not led to amendments of arbitral awards. On the contrary, the court used the constitutional review to reassert their commitment toward arbitration. Uh, very illustrative to that regard is the decision of the Colombian Constitutional Court that stated that tutela action against international awards is highly exceptional. It is not proper for the tutela action to replace the ordinary or special proceedings provided for the protection of a constitutional right. Nonetheless, constitutional actions delay justice create legal uncertainty, and undermines the finality of arbitral awards, which has an overall negative impact on the system. In addition, at least two other slightly concerning issues emerged from the research. First, the Argentinian Supreme Court modified an award to adjust it to public policy requirements. It did so in order to allow its recognition in enforcement, so to say, in support of arbitration. Can a national court do that? Second, the courts from Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico have concluded that there is no breach of public policy if the award only affects the private interest of the parties but not national interest or those of the community. Well, usually the commercial arbitration affects most and mainly parties' private interest, which means there is hard to find a breach of public policy. This certainly reduces the scope for challenges of awards, which is a positive sign, but from a conceptual point of view, it is worth questioning whether the approach taken by the court is correct. I want to stress that beyond those minor, peculiar exceptions, if the Latin American courts refrain from applying idiosyncratic notions and if they state the universally recognized concepts and provisions, all those very but have young, the awards are confirmed and enforced. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, um, for your participation from Latin America. Uh, we have one more um, contribution. And as a French qualified lawyer and a, a, a lawyer from the Paris Bar, I might say we actually have left the best at the end because we are now looking at France. Uh, one of the most important arbitration jurisdictions, arguably, in the world. Um, and also one that is at the forefront of a lot of um, sometimes quite controversial solutions. And so I'm very pleased that Joanna is, had, looked, had a look at uh, the data set from a French perspective. Joanna, uh, Dr. Joanna Knoll Tudor, is a partner at Jante in Paris and Budapest. And she's also wearing many different hats um, and among others, is a board member and a driving force, really, behind the Paris Arbitration Week. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to you, uh, Joanna, um, as the final speaker. Thank you. Oh, and sorry, one housekeeping uh, uh, remark before I do so. Uh, for the online attendees, and I know there are quite a few, um, if you do have any uh, questions uh, for the Q&A session that will follow uh, shortly, um, please do put them in the Q&A. I will then put uh, the questions to the speakers if you type them in the uh, Q&A panel that you find um, at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. You are now over to you. After um, uh, listening uh, uh, to Elena speaking about the continent, it feels like we are in the very small uh, jurisdiction that France is. Uh, but um, it's true that the results of the empirical research were quite interesting. And um, what I tried to do in my contribution is to look at the results, um, which again were, were, were quite surprising, as you will see in a second. And um, on the one hand, try to justify these results, uh, or at least their um, uh, awkwardness, uh, and, and also um, try to bring some, uh, some uh, um, 
light on, on some of the, the issues that have been found related to France. Um, basically, uh, why were these, uh, these results uh, awkward, at least to most of us? It's because uh, despite Paris being one of the um, seats of arbitration, the most popular ones, um, the results showed that um, uh, it was Fran the French courts were the ones among the jurisdictions uh, which were part of the study, which were the least likely to enforce or recognize awards. And the second uh, uh, one was that it was also the uh, uh, least likely to vacate awards. So um, the, the question was, how was this, um, how was this uh, possible? Um, what we uh, found by, by looking at the procedure was that Concerning the enforcement and recognition, um, you may remember, I think, uh, maybe some of you have mentioned it, uh, I, I don't remember, that basically the study only included uh, reasoned decisions. Um, uh, and decisions uh, uh, reasoned when you look at the way in which enforcement and recognition uh, works in fr under French uh, law, under French procedural law, it's true that um, a lot of the uh, decisions are actually not included in the, in, the, in the study for the simple reason that executive procedures in France are ex parte. So in order uh, to have a reasoned uh, decision, yeah, the, the, uh, the order has to refuse the enforcement. So you already have all those um, uh, 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 orders which uh, actually enforce and recognize, which are not taken into account in the, in the study. And it, uh, also the other specificity of the French uh, procedural law is that uh, the Court of Appeal uh, decisions which dismiss um, a set-aside request automatically enforce uh, the awards, uh, which also means that, that those in those cases, you don't see uh, those cases included in the award. So the uh, in the in the um, uh, research, sorry. So the uh, conclusion would be that um, uh, the results that we saw and which were again rather awkward um, were due to the fact that um, using this method of only taking into account recent uh, recent decisions may not be the most adapted method uh, for looking to to the French uh, jurisdiction. So uh, this was reassuring for all those of us who uh, are in Paris and have uh, a seat of arbitration in Paris. So I just want to reassure everybody, I think things are much better than uh, when looking at the, at the research. Um, as uh, an almond is concerned, um, again, um, the, the, I, I think I, I made a, a mistake earlier, um, I, I apologize for that. It was the, the results showed that France is the highest number, uh, has the highest number of vacated awards. Uh, the reality actually is not far from that, and the reason for that to found is that when you look at the past years, the number of annulment uh, procedures has actually doubled. And when you look at the uh, rate of success of annulment procedures, this is around 25% of, uh, of, uh, of success in, that, in, in, in annulment. The other thing that we did in the, um, in the, uh, in the article is that um, I looked at the grounds invoked by the parties, by claimants, <coughs> Uh, in both enforcement and annulment, and um, uh, what, what we what we saw, and I think um, I think Monique mentioned uh, public policy violation of public policy. What we found in terms of annulment is that the two uh, grounds which are the most often uh, relied upon are also the ones which are the most successful. One of them being violation of public policy, and another one being uh, authority not in accordance with law. As enforcement is concerned, in terms of, again, grounds invoked by claimants, uh, well, here we found that uh, violation of public policy was indeed the most uh, invoked reason, but was by far not the most successful. Um, the most successful ones uh, were those invoked um, a few times, but very successfully so, and they were, uh, the award is not binding, the award was not final, uh, the award exceeded the scope of the submission, uh, the submission of arbitration, and finally, and again, I think um, Monique mentioned that, sovereign immunity of, uh, of the state. 
Um, but um, um, I will not go further than that. Um, I will let you read uh, this uh, very, very uh, interesting and rich uh, edition of, uh, of, of Joya. And I will also say that inside the article, um, I also looked at some of, uh, some of, the, of the decisions themselves, but I also added some of those which were not actually included in the research in order to give really um, as much as possible uh, a full picture of, um, of France. Thank you very much, and uh, I think we are ready for questions. Thank you, Joanna, um, uh, for your uh, excellent presentation. And I think it's a good reminder that if we look at data, uh, you need to think about the numbers. Sometimes the numbers tell you something which is counterintuitive, and there's a good reason for that. And this is, uh, Joanna did a very good job in explaining why, in this particular case, maybe there was a selection bias in the data set. Uh, because of the ways um, uh, decisions are structured and made um, in France. So that's a very important reminder uh, for um, how empirical research and the methodology is quite important. Um, Krina, you had a comment. Uh, one, one final point we wanted to, to thank very much to the other authors included in this uh, special issue of the Journal of International Arbitration who could not be with us for personal reasons or because the time difference is challenging. Uh, Lucas Mistelis and Gianmarco Rao, who looked at the extension of the arbitration agreement to non-signatories, to Larry Shore, Vittoria De Benenetteni, and Mario De Nito Persone, who looked at pathological clauses, and uh, of course Arthur Dong and Alex Yuan, who, who took a view on Asia, um, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, uh, and PRC, mainland China. Uh, we'd like to make a note of that and thank them as well. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll hand it uh, to the floor for questions, comments. Um, I have some on uh, the screen here, but uh, we can start uh, with the floor if you have any immediate questions or comments, please. There's a mic if you could just uh, introduce, give your name, uh, your affiliation, and uh, put your questions to the panel. Hi, thank you. Yes, Valimir uh, Zhivkovic, University of Warwick. So, uh, <coughs> just a quick question. <coughs> Maybe <coughs> Matthew Hall, sorry, uh, could also have help here. Uh, it's more about interpreting what the numbers tell us and how we describe what the numbers tell us. So, you mentioned in the beginning when we are talking about the rates of uh, vacatur and the rates of actual enforcement. So, 23% in one case, 27% in other, right? So we are talking. Let's say it's 25, one quarter. It seems to be described here in the, <coughs> in the leading article and in different places elsewhere that that's a very rare occurrence, right? So that the vast majority of cases get, or that it's a rare event that we get a vacatur or a refusal of enforcement. But would you say that one in, one in four is a rare event? I mean, are we really talking about something which is rare? Because in statistical terms, a rare event would be more like 5%. Mm -hmm. And even in, 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 like in, in regular speech, if you have one in five or one in four, so there's four of you, right? Mm -hmm. You judge with one case and one, one decision is refused enforcement, that's not really rare. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll take that. Uh, I think I use that language because of the perception, you know, the anecdotal perception that enforcement actions are perhaps, you know, not as commonly enforced. So, but the fact that you're saying 20, you know, what is it, 27% of the time they actually, the challenge is successful, you're saying that might encourage defendants to do, bring more of these challenges and, and to not settle or to not simply just assume that I'll pay and, and if they can win 27% of the time, then maybe we should actually be more vigorous in our decisions about whether or not to defend it. So I was comparing it from a, a, a fairly artificial benchmark of the anecdotal impressions that one has. Um, but uh, I think you're right. I think that you would say that roughly 25% is not terribly unsuccessful, right? That that leads to suggestions that maybe it's worth it from a strategic litigation perspective to do more set-aside challenges or do more enforcement challenges. I don't know, Karina, many. 
I would also think that this has to be put in perspective, as we were saying in the beginning, because majority of the cases would uh, the arbitral award will be complied with voluntarily, and and roughly in in about forty percent of the cases, as the Queen Mary survey revealed in two thousand and eight. Uh, actually, there is a post-award settlement when you have, uh, obviously, the award paid at a discounted rate. So if, if you put this percentage in the vast majority of arbitral awards that we have, it will give you a different number. Right. And, and in absolute numbers, that will say, well, actually, a few uh, awards are set aside and few awards are refused recognition and enforcement. I just wanted to add one thing about legitimacy of arbitration. So the anecdotal evidence is that uh, you know, all the arbitrators are doing these things, nobody knows who they are, nobody knows, it's all confidential, secret, done aside. And instead, I think that this empirical data research and that percentage exactly shows that the court are checking what arbitrators are doing. It's not a rubber stamp. So this, to me, actually is very important because it means that if it were they are only 5%, means that court would not really look at what has happened. Because of course, party are generally compliant, so it's the minority that goes to court, and then they are the courts, they're really looking at everything. So I think actually, for me, that number is reassuring. And just to add to that, I think it is absolutely right that you say it depends on how we read these numbers. We, we've looked at those numbers, and it is important now to think about what do the numbers tell us. And I think w the takeaway here is not, if I have an award, I have a chance in 25% of the cases or 20% of the cases right. to get this annulled. That would not be a good advice that you give to your clients. It is of the cases where the award was not voluntarily performed, as Karina said, and where actually someone thought about it and said, well, we might actually have a chance to go to a set aside of those cases only, or I don't know which adjective you want to put it, but 20% um, were set aside or whatever the number is that you wanted, wanted to use as an example. So I think it is very important to put that in perspective. Um, and so don't take a, a, the advice to your clients, oh, you have a, you know, one in a four chance to set aside an award. I think that would be um, a bad advice to give to your clients. Any other questions or comments here in the, um, in the audience, um, in the room? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I'm looking forward to reading each and every of the <laughs> articles just to see the, the specific numbers. But numerous times we have heard about the anecdotal uh, evidence, but now we actually have the numbers, right? So would you think that this special edition will become in a sort of success rate handbook for parties, which will essentially encourage or discourage parties in bringing certain arguments or not bringing certain arguments in the setting aside enforcement recognition uh, proceedings? Thank so you. We, as the authors and editors of this, would hope that that would exactly <laughs> happen, that, that <laughs> practitioners would look at these numbers and not just you know, make you know, strategic hunches about what likely would happen, but actually can, can, can analyze the empirical evidence and use that as part of the, I guess you could say, equation in their decision making. I think that that probably will happen. I think looking at investment arbitration, uh, we see that it, that has happened with the empirical research that's been done in investment arbitration over the past 15 years. So I think that, and of course, this is the beginning of what, what we hope is much more empirical research uh, and, and uh, analysis of these sorts of decisions. So hopefully, yeah, that would be great. And maybe as a scholar, I can add, I, I would also hope that you know this is the start of more empirical research being done in commercial arbitration. This was really a sort of, uh, idea right. um, to be at the forefront, to be the first to look at this, um, but I, I, I would, from a scholar's perspective, would actually hope that this is only a starting point. And, and one of the questions, and this is actually a good segue into one of the questions that I have online, and this is to the three of you, is do you have any next projects in terms of, <laughs> you know, data sets, number crunching um, that you want to do? Do you want me to think? Sure. So obviously we did not look at international arbitration agreements and how national courts are enforcing agreements. 
and it's all in the data set, it's ready to go. And so the next project is that we will be looking at a similar research project with respect to national court enforcement of, na of international agreements. And then more longer term, we're going to do you know, a five year retrospective on this project you know, coming in 2027 or 2028 or whatever and sort of try to update where this will be you know, uh, at re regular intervals. But definitely international arbitration agreement analysis and empirical research of that would be our next project. So stay tuned. Um, any other questions or comments from the floor? Everyone is ready for the drinks? Yeah. It is indeed <laughs> five past seven. I did promise you uh, uh, drinks and canapes.